Welcome to Linda's Corner, a podcast created to inspire hope, increase joy, and motivate positive change. Hi, my name is Linda Bjork. I'm an author, teacher, speaker, blogger, and founder and executive director of Hope for Healing, which is a nonprofit charity designed to help alleviate symptoms of depression and anxiety, relieve stress, build confidence and self esteem, and heal relationships. You can learn more by visiting our website at hopeforhealingfoundation.org. For today's episode, I'm going to share a segment from one of my books called Crushed. If you're joining us for the first time, I would suggest that you start at the first podcast, since stories tend to make more sense when you read them, or listen to them, in order from the beginning to the end. Chapter 10 Endurance Plan I was relieved when she finally moved on to the next aspect of identity. To begin her explanation of the mental aspect of identity, Suzanne returned to her personal story. My plan was to endure in misery for the rest of my life. I figured that was my lot in life and that I was strong enough to do it. I have since written a new story of my future life, one that includes peace and happiness with wonderful relationships with my husband, children, and the people around me. It's a good story, and I'm loving life, but I can promise you that if I hadn't changed how I perceived my life to be, I would have continued to live out my original story for the rest of my life. We create our own life's experiences. If you don't like the story you're in, then you'd be wise to write a new one. She drew a circle on the board and wrote the word thoughts in it. Then she drew a heart and wrote feelings in it. She drew two more circles with the words actions and results. Our thoughts create our feelings, she explained, and drew an arrow from thoughts to feelings. Our feelings are the fuel that lead to our actions. She drew another arrow from feelings to actions. And our actions lead to our results. She drew another arrow from actions to results. Then this cycle repeats itself, with the results leading to our thoughts again. She drew another arrow completing the cycle. There are two places in this cycle where we have the greatest power to make changes, she continued. It's very difficult to change the way we feel, and results just happen, but we can choose to control our thoughts and our actions. These are the two points where we have power. If we don't manage our thoughts, it's like getting in a boat and just drifting. In order to steer, you have to control your thoughts. Thoughts are the beginning of change. They are the beginning of obtaining new results. Emotions are our fuel. They are what lead us to our actions. Good fuel leads to good actions. She drew another picture to illustrate the next analogy. Our minds are like the soil in a field. If I plant tomatoes in this field, I'm going to reap tomatoes. But if I plant hemlock, I'm going to reap hemlock. If I plant positive thoughts, I'm going to get positive results. On the other hand, if I plant poisonous negative thoughts, I'm going to get negative results. This is called the law of the harvest. You reap what you plant. That's a natural law and goes along with another law that we already talked about, the law of attraction, which is that whatever we send out comes back to us amplified and multiplied, just like planting seeds. The result is bigger than the seed we planted. Damn, I thought. That seems logical and reasonable. That means that I need to make changes. I need to plant new seeds. I've got to quit planting negative thoughts. How do I do that? I want you to write down your top five negative thoughts. These are thoughts that keep coming back at you again and again, she said. 
Then I want you to write two new positive responses to counter those negative thoughts. She gave us a few minutes to think and write, then brought out a plastic bat and a pillow. Okay, she said, I need a volunteer who's willing to share their negative thoughts and positive declarations they'll use to replace them. A volunteer came forward and handed Suzanne her list. Okay, she said, I'm going to read off one of your old negative thoughts and toss this pillow at you. You're going to swing the bat and knock the pillow away while you give your new positive answer. Are you ready? You're not good enough, Suzanne read off the list while tossing the pillow. I'm doing the best I can, the volunteer yelled and swung the bat, knocking the pillow across the room. Your house is never clean, Suzanne yelled as she tossed the pillow again. I'm doing more important things, the volunteer yelled as she swung the bat again. You're not perfect. You'll never be perfect, Suzanne called out as she tossed the pillow a third time. I'm good enough, the volunteer yelled and swung. Okay, we'll set down the bat and the pillow, Suzanne said as she gathered up her props. But this is what I want you to do, metaphorically, every time one of those negative thoughts comes into your mind. You swat it away with something positive. Have your answers ready and use them over and over again every time those negative thoughts creep back in. Now, in our minds we have different levels of thought. She drew a circle on the board and drew a horizontal line dividing it in half. We have our conscious thought, she wrote conscious on the top half of the circle, and our subconscious thought, she wrote subconscious on the bottom half of the circle. Our conscious thought is our reasoning. We have agency or control over these thoughts. The subconscious is more like a computer. It is automated and runs on programs that we either inherited or created earlier in our life. For every thought that your conscious mind comes up with, your subconscious runs through a million. It's always busy in the background, taking care of business. The job of your subconscious is to keep you safe, comfortable, and alive. It builds its database of programs on its interpretation of your past experiences. What our subconscious believes is safe constitutes our comfort zone. However, the subconscious can have faulty programs, she continued. They run automatically, even though they're wrong. Ideas like, I can't try new things. I always fail. I'm not good enough. I deserve to be poor or mistreated. Come from faulty subconscious programs we either inherited or created earlier in life. The good news is that your conscious mind can create new programs, and if you use these new programs consistently, then your subconscious mind can adopt them to override the old ones. The new subconscious programs are just as easy to run as the old faulty ones. She paused for another sip of water. It begins with a plan. Creation is an idea before it becomes a reality. The first step is to decide what you want. Visualize what you want your life to be like. What is your idea of an ideal marriage? What is your idea of an ideal life? She gave us a few moments to write down some of the things that we wanted. Chapter 11, Lost Voice. I wrote, I want peace, acceptance, love, identity, safety, connection, happiness, contentment, abundance, and beauty. I want to be useful. I want to be valued. I might have written more, but it was time for our first guest speaker to begin. Young, beautiful, and vivacious, Erica began discussing the emotion component of our identity by covering the topic, Finding Your Voice. She began with the story of the Little Mermaid and how the Little Mermaid gave up her voice and needed to get it back. We can lose our voice and become disconnected when we stop talking, she said. I had two traumatic events in my life that caused me to lose my voice. When I was 13, I was involved in a tragedy and found myself surrounded by people who accused me and condemned me and crushed me. 
I learned that if I spoke, those words were used against me, so I must keep my mouth shut. Later, I had an emotionally manipulative boyfriend who controlled me and wouldn't allow me to have my own thoughts and feelings. He told me what I was allowed to think and what I was allowed to feel. I learned that I need to keep everything inside in order to be safe, so I swallowed my words, my thoughts, and my feelings. Until I heard her speak, the thought never occurred to me that I had lost my voice. I didn't speak. In any social situation, with whatever company, wherever I was, I stayed silent. Why don't I talk? I wondered. When did I lose my voice? Perhaps it was because I didn't want to engage in conversation where people might ask me questions. Perhaps it was because I felt I had so much to hide. Perhaps it was because I figured I didn't have anything of value to say. Perhaps it was because I assumed people didn't want to listen to me. Perhaps I feared that people would not respect what I had to say but would ridicule me for it. I kept silent for so long that I didn't even realize I was doing it. This new thought struck me like an epiphany. I didn't know that I had lost my voice, but now that I realized it was missing, I wanted my voice back. I wanted to be heard. I wanted to matter. Erica shared two tools that she used to let go of negative emotion and three empowerment tools that she used to build herself up. Again, the pattern is to release negative and add positive to create that positive account balance. I use complete conversations and what Kirk Duncan calls slaying the dragon to let go of negative emotions, Erica said. I don't understand what these terms mean. I thought. It's like they're speaking a foreign language. I hear sounds, but they mean nothing to me. How do I apply these if I don't even understand what it means, let alone how to do it? I despaired. Slaying the dragon is writing out your feelings on paper and then destroying the paper either by tearing it up or by burning it, she explained. I personally like the satisfaction I get when I burn them, she laughed. You began by writing this on the top of the page. I feel blank about blank because. For example, if you're writing about losing your voice, you might write, I feel unsafe about communicating because. Then write everything that comes to your mind. Write until you can't think of anything else to write and then move the pen to the next line and wait. Ideas will come to your mind. Just write them down. When nothing else comes to your mind, you know you're done for now. It's time to tear it up or burn it. Whenever you do a written dump, you want to get those feelings out, but you don't want to save them. You want to let them go. The idea is not to fuel the anger or bitterness, but to let it go. Healing comes from acknowledging and letting go. I also use complete conversations, also called energetic conversations, to let go. While slaying the dragon is a way to release through writing, complete conversations are a verbal release. It's like speaking to an imaginary friend. You don't actually have a conversation with the person, but you address their higher self. You imagine asking for their permission to talk to them, and then you let them have it. Tell them all the things you've been holding back. You might even be yelling and swearing, and that's a good thing. Just get it all out. When you can't think of anything else to say, then you need to apologize to them for feeling all those negative thoughts and emotions toward them. Apologizing brings healing. I have had multiple complete conversations with that manipulative boyfriend, and I told him all the things that I could never tell him when we were together. You can also have complete conversations with yourself. 
I had a complete conversation with my 13-year-old self. I yelled at her and told her that she ruined my life. The let go techniques are used to release negative energy, but additional tools are needed to add positive energy. I call them empowerment techniques, Erica continued. I use imagination, singing, and declarations. Imagination and visualization are very powerful. I might look at a picture online of a person talking while smiling and print it out. Seeing that picture helps me be able to imagine myself being able to be happy about talking. Singing is another tool to help empower, and it is especially helpful when you've lost your voice. Declarations are what they sound like. You're declaring something to be true, she explained. My declarations are, my words have value, and I have the courage to speak my truth. I repeat these each morning and each night before I go to bed. One last thought, she concluded. Don't be discouraged when you're not able to regain your voice overnight. It took years to get broken. It's going to take time to heal. Erica's words resonated with me. She said she had lost her voice, but here she was speaking to a group of people. Whatever she was doing to heal was obviously working. I liked the idea of having tools to heal. Usually, you just get cheerleader talk of, you can do it. You're expected to change the way you think, but no one teaches you how to do it. She used specific tools to let go and other tools to empower. That gives a plan of action something a person can actually do in order to change. I wasn't sure I understood how to use those tools yet, but I was starting to believe that those tools existed and they may actually help. That meant I could actually do something about me. I was also intrigued by her mention of a complete conversation with her 13-year-old self. Events happen at certain ages in my life, and it made sense to be able to deal with those events individually if needed. I was a different person at age 6 or 20 or whenever those events occurred. Furthermore, if I can have a complete conversation with myself at any age, then that means I can also have a complete conversation with someone else at any age. That gives me the possibility of confronting people who have hurt me in the past but have changed. I'm not angry with who and what they are now, but I still carry anger at how they hurt me before. Somehow this idea freed me to disconnect the person as they are today from the past event. After Erica sat down, Suzanne rose for the concluding session of the day. I want to explain more about declarations and complete conversations, she began. Declarations are positive statements about yourself, who you are, and what you want to become. Some of the most basic declarations are, I love myself, I know who I am, and I am loved. At first, you may not believe your own declarations. It may go like this, I love myself. And your subconscious shouts out, liar. I know who I am. And your subconscious shouts out, yeah, right. I am loved. And your subconscious shouts out, that's never going to happen. Don't listen to your subconscious. It's running on faulty programs. It will take a while before it believes those words. But if you keep at it, eventually your subconscious will stop fighting and eventually embrace those declarations. I want you to write down five declarations for yourself. Print them out and put them in a place where you can see them. Repeat them three times each morning when you get up and each night before you go to bed. 
It will only take about two minutes to do, she reassured us. The last thoughts that you have before you go to bed are very important, since they may go through your mind over and over while you're asleep. Repeating your declarations before you go to bed will help your subconscious make those new pathways and new programs quicker. Your nightly routine is very important, she taught. If you go to bed thinking of all the things that you didn't get done that day, those things will run over and over in your mind while you're sleeping and increase your stress. Instead, start the habit of validating what you did that was good during the day and claiming your successes. You could write a gratitude journal or write down two things that you accomplished that day. I want to explain more about complete conversations, she said. Why are they called complete conversations? What does that mean? Someone asked. Good question. We all use a personal filter when we speak to people. We might share some of the things that we're thinking or feeling, but we hold a lot back. If we told everybody all the things we really feel about them, we wouldn't have any friends left, right? We laughed guiltily. A complete conversation is your chance to say the rest of what you're feeling. You don't hold anything back. You put it all on the table. Now, it's very important to clarify that the person that you're having this conversation with is not in the room with you. You are by yourself. You address their higher self as you imagine them in your mind and talk to that. A person's higher self can handle you yelling at them and telling them how you feel. But if you did that to the actual person, nothing good would come of it, she warned. Complete conversations have a few key components. First, you address the person's higher self. Second, you dump and let them have it. And third, you say you're sorry and ask for forgiveness. Some people have tried this and say it didn't work. It didn't create any closure or healing. But that's always because they left out that last crucial step of saying sorry and asking for forgiveness. But it's not my fault. I didn't do anything wrong. It was them, they will say. She shook her head. It doesn't matter. It will not work if you leave out that part. If you can only say, I'm sorry, please forgive me for feeling that way, it will be enough, but you must apologize or it will not bring any healing or closure. After you have had that three-part conversation with the person's higher self, you're not done yet. You need to have another three-part complete conversation with God and another three-part complete conversation with yourself. You hear people talk about the need to forgive yourself. This is a literal way to apply that. It is an important step. Now, for me personally, Suzanne added, I have to break down this process even further. In the portion where you have a complete conversation with God, I need to break that down into conversations with each member of the Godhead because I have a different relationship with God the Father than with Jesus Christ or the Holy Ghost. That made sense to me. I hadn't realized it until she said it, but I had a kind of good cop, bad cop idea about the Godhood. I was grateful for the Savior's atoning grace, but I always felt like God the Father was the one who shoved me under the bus in the first place. When I tried this complete conversation thing, I would break my conversation with God into three parts as well. What do you say in your complete conversation with God? Someone asked. I wouldn't know what to say. Well, remember the three parts of the complete conversation. First, you address God the Father. You don't need to say your higher self because that's his only self. Dump and say whatever you feel. Then conclude with something like, I'm sorry for feeling that way. Please forgive me. The complete conversation with the Savior might include something like, I'm sorry I didn't give this to you sooner. Please forgive me. Finally, the complete conversation with the Holy Ghost might conclude with something like, 
I'm sorry for keeping you from me. Please forgive me, she suggested. Some of my clients don't believe in God the way that I do, and that's okay. You can simply address a higher power in a similar way. I know that faith isn't fashionable right now, but if you want healing, that spiritual aspect is crucial. There is no other way. Every addiction recovery program includes acknowledging a higher power. It is a necessary component of healing. Interesting, I thought. These are things I've never thought of doing before. I have one more object lesson before we finish for the day. She brought out an empty water pitcher on a tray. These ping pong balls represent the negative, yucky stuff that you have trapped inside you. She added several ping pong balls to the pitcher. They may be hidden at the bottom and may not even be bothering you much, but they're in there. She then added water to the ping pong ball pitcher from a water bottle. Adding water represents our efforts to change and fill ourselves with positive. As you begin to add positive, you'll notice that those negative things that have settled to the bottom begin to rise to the top. You will remember things that you have buried or maybe even forgotten, and you will have to deal with them. As she filled the pitcher with water, the ping pong balls did indeed rise to the surface. However, if you continue to fill yourself with positive, then eventually you will be able to clear the negative. She continued to fill the pitcher with water until the balls floated up and spilled over the sides of the pitcher, leaving it filled with nothing but clean, clear water. You need to understand before you begin the process of healing that it will bring up pain and it will be hard. That doesn't mean you're on the wrong path, she assured us. When the yuck comes up, just let it go. It is a necessary part of the process of cleaning it out. Here's one last thought for the day. We each have our own personal mess, and that is the gift that we have to help others. Your mess is your message, she concluded. Your mess is your message? I mentally repeated. Well, I'm certainly a mess. Perhaps I have a message too. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed this section of the book. The next section is available on the following podcast. Please subscribe to receive updates when new episodes are available. The book Crushed is available on Amazon. And the audiobook version will soon be available on Amazon, Audible, and iTunes. Again, my name is Linda Bjork. You can find more information by searching for Linda Bjork Hope for Healing, Linda Bjork Two Good Things, and Linda Bjork Innovative Joy. In closing, I'd like to leave you with an inspirational quote by Henry Nguyen. Joy does not simply happen to us. We have to choose joy and keep choosing it every day. I hope that today you choose joy. See you next time on Linda's Corner.